It's episode 204 of the Author Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Hank Garner. Join me each week on Tuesdays and Fridays for new episodes of the Author Stories Podcast, interviews with the very best authors in publishing today. Find all the archives at hankgarner.com, and when you're there, please subscribe. It helps other people find the show. I'd like to thank some sponsors this week. Uh, Dominion Rising, 23 all-new novels of fantasy and science fiction. Uh, Thousands and thousands of pages in this set uh, that is destined to be the biggest blockbuster set of the summer. It releases in just a couple of weeks, but you can get your pre-order in for only 99 cents. And uh, my guests today, Gwen White and Aaron St. Pierre, have a book. Uh, in this set, all new novels, not uh, not novels that have been published before and then repackaged, all new. There's a link in the show notes, Dominion Rising, go pick up your copy today. Also, Galactic Satori Chronicles by Nick Breaker and Paul E. Hicks. When a thirst for revenge sends one man on a deadly journey through the galaxy in the adrenaline-pumping new novel, Galactic Satori Chronicles. There are two installments out now, Book 1 Earth and Book 2 Kron, some of the very best page-turning science fiction available. There's a link to it in the show notes. My good buddy Ed Gosney at his blog at edgosney.com runs one of the best comics blogs, cool comics in my collection. Uh, Go read it each week. I do. I think you'll learn something, and uh, maybe it'll turn on uh, your desire to collect comics again. Or like me, go back and revisit some of those storylines that you missed from when you were a kid. Uh, Also, uh, I just found out that Ed's book, Transmutations, uh, there's an audiobook available now. This is a fantastic book, and I think you'll really love it. Go pick up the audiobook of Transmutations. As always, we're going to have an audio clip at the end of the show uh, for Richard Glebe's The Jason Crane series, and uh, I think you're going to love it. There's a link to it in the show notes. Uh, One more thing before we get started on our show. Uh, A couple of months ago, I was invited to DragonCon as a a media guest to uh, come cover the event. But I got an email over the weekend uh, saying that they had listened to the show and had been following the show and uh, were going to uh, escalate that invitation, uh, if you will, and uh, allow author stories to have a very prominent role in covering it. And they're going to provide us with a room uh, with lighting and backdrops and all of that kind of stuff to do video interviews and give us access to their Walk of Fame uh, guests, which are, you know, kind of the the big names that draw people to these cons. Uh, So I would love your help uh, in doing this uh, to really cover the event like we really want to and to do it justice. I need to buy some new equipment and uh, need to cover some travel costs and stuff like that. So there's a link in there where you can help be an executive producer for the Dragon Con coverage. Everyone that donates gets an executive producer credit in all of that coverage. And uh, we've had some very generous folks so far. We're making a dent in it. We still have a ways to go, though. So uh, thank you for supporting the show. If you've learned something or gotten some motivation from the show, uh, please show your love and support at paypal.me slash author Hank Garner. Now on to our show. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I have a really fantastic show for you. Gwen White and Aaron St. Pierre are with me on the show today. They are writing partners, uh, but more than that, they are a mother-daughter team uh, that's doing some really, really interesting stuff right now. Uh, So welcome to the show, Gwen and Aaron. Thank you. Thank you, Hank. Uh, I begin each show uh, with the same question, and that question is, and I'll begin with you, Gwen, and then we'll ask Aaron, uh, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, it's so clear. I must have been about seven or eight, and I was in love with the Pookie, the Flying Rabbit books. Um, I can't remember who the author was, but I was obsessed with those books, Pookie the Flying Rabbit. And I wrote some fan fiction of Pookie the Flying Rabbit, and I took it to my dad, and he was singularly unimpressed (laughs) that it was fan fiction, that I hadn't come up with this, you know, amazing concept myself. But I didn't let that deter me. And um, I've basically written for most of my life. It started off with... 
uh, non-fiction stuff. I did uh, corporate writing, copywriting in, in the corporate world years ago. Um, I've written travel books. I've written um, non-fiction travel memoirs. And now I'm, I've come home to my love, which is Pookie the Rabbit, I suppose. It's fantasy, fantasy and science fiction. And that's where my heart is and that's where um, – I'll always be really as a writer. I love that. Um, and I, let's let's come back around to that in just a minute. Let's bring Aaron in uh, because I definitely want to talk about the uh, fantasy and the love of that and, and what it is that really intrigues you about that. Uh, but Aaron, uh, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? Um, I, I always loved reading as a child, and then when I was six, my mum bought me a copy of The Chronicles of Narnia, The Magician's Nephew, and I, I, fell, I fell in love like I'd never known love to exist, and wow. was, it was like waking up, and suddenly this was what I was. I was a storyteller, and I started writing ideas, and I even made a couple movies based off of some screenplays that I wrote as a child. And I was actually going through some of my old documents um, from when I was a really young teenager and reading through some of those stories. And my word, I was cringing all through them because they were <laughs> so, so bad when I was like 13, 14. And I'm, uh, yeah. So it's kind of always been there. And then having a mum as an author just for just instilled even more of that need to write and need to tell stories in me. And now we work together, which is pretty great. <laughs> that, that is pretty great. Um, Gwen, uh, why did you get her The Magician's Nephew? Uh, why that book in the series? I, th I thought I got you the whole no, book, I, <laughs> I still have them. You gave them to, uh, they gave me the magician's nephew first because we went to, I remember the day we were in a, a shop called exclusive books and you were looking at all these books and I was like, well, I don't want children's books anymore. Cause I was looking at the really, really kiddie versions. Cause I was like six years old. I want big books. So you pointed out Narnia. Yeah. And I think I got the magician's nephew because it's actually the first book yes, in the, in the, in the, the, the chronological book, right. always is for the line, the witch in the wardrobe. But really, to understand the Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, you need the history, yeah. and that comes in the nephew. And I think because I'm very linear, I, I tend to do things in a very linear fashion. Right. Um, my OCD couldn't cope <laughs> with not having it starting where it well, needed in to that start. Case, in that case, you should have got me uh, the, um, after the – Magician's Navy, you should have gone to the line, the witch in the wardrobe. You gave me the last battle, which is the final book. So, <laughs> oh, sandwiched. What can I say? Uh, yeah. I've I've caused a rift in the family. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. We'll remember it. Oh man, I I uh, my kids and I are huge, or my my whole family, my wife and kids and I are huge Narnia fans, and and we I read that series to them uh, when. Uh, when, when my kids were very young and, and I remember, uh, I read them in the order that they were published, but then I remember that there was this big, I guess it maybe was around the time that the movies started. Maybe they started talking about the movies, the, the Disney adaptations and, and, uh, they re-released, uh, maybe a 50th anniversary. I can't remember. Anyway, I bought another set and they reordered them in the chronological order and I had never read them like that. And so that's why I asked that question. And, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a totally different experience when you read them quote out of publication order, but in the chronological order. So, yeah. Yes. Um, Gwen, were you a Narnia fan, uh, when you were a kid? I actually came to Narnia as an adult, which is surprising, uh, because my my father particularly made sure I read everything. Um, but a lot of the, the, the things that I read as a child, I read all Rudyard Kipling, I read um, uh, Ryder Haggard, I read a, a lot of that kind. I read a lot of adventure as a child, right. um, also more than straight fantasy. Um and uh, I, I love adventure. 
any pick up a book of mine and you will find an adventure at the heart. There could be romance, there could be um, you know intrigue, there'll be whatever else is going on, but in the right at the heart of it is an adventure. Uh, I can't write anything else really. Absolutely. Um, I, I've read uh, uh, a couple of your books, and that is uh, let's see, Blood Rites, I believe, Dragon's Fire, uh, and I've read part of uh, the, the first one in that series. Um, and uh, and that's what I, I was uh, thinking. Yeah, th- these are fantastic adventure books. These are, uh, you know you talk about having these other elements kind of wrapped up in there, but uh, page turning adventure books. Uh, You grew up in South Africa, didn't you? Yes, I was born in South Africa. Uh, So was Erin. But I come from on my father's side, uh, his father was Welsh. So born and bred spoke Welsh. So I've got that heritage. And then I've got a, a heritage in South Africa going back to 1682. So I'm very mixed as to who and what I am. I'm now right. basically rootless. We left South Africa <laughs> in 2013 and we had a stint in the UK for a couple of years. And we moved to Australia November last year. And quite frankly, we have spent the last six, eight months doing nothing but write books so I haven't really gone further than my local grocery store. I'm ashamed <laughs> to say, if even that, if even that. So, yeah, I've got it. to start making Australia home. I love it. Uh, you just described most Americans in <laughs> that we we all are from somewhere. Uh, we don't really have a lot of roots. Uh, we're kind of a, a mixture of a bunch of things. Uh, but especially in the South where I live, we uh, we tend to have very strong uh, uh, English and Scottish and Irish heritage. And, uh, I think a lot of those, uh, those great myths and stories have kind of bled down through our, our lineage. Um, it, are there any, um, any traditional South African, uh, myths and legends that work their way into, uh, kind of fantasy literature, and you know, we I, I think when we think of fantasy, we think of this very um, British kind of uh, form of story. Uh, are there any things that are are traditionally South African that work their way into the literature there? Yes, definitely. Um, South Africa's got a very very rich tradition. I mean, you've got the 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 Eurocentric, which would be the UK, and you've got uh, stories that came from Holland, the Dutch stories. But then you've right. also got the traditional stories of the, the black African people, the Khoisan people, the Bushman people, um, which are so rich and so uh, interesting and obviously all grown from the land, um, all relating to animals, um, the, hy- the the jackal, the, the hyena, the, you know, all these animals that have taken on a persona, that have been given a persona and um, that drive through the mythology. Um, mention an animal in, in South African or a bird in South Africa and it comes with a whole, uh, whole character. character. It does. It the character. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating, actually. I love it. Um, Gwen, uh, you you talked about your love of fantasy and uh, and your father kind of really stoking that. Um, what is it about those types of stories that keep bringing you back uh, to uh, to to loving those and to wanting to tell those types of stories? Anything goes in fantasy if you can imagine it, if you can conceive it, you can create it. And um, that's what I love. I, I like being able to just be unfettered by, well, this is how the world works and it's three-dimensional and this is what we do and, and this is, you know, I, I don't like that. I like to be out of that box. And uh, once you go into a fantasy or a sci-fi realm, perhaps maybe not hard sci-fi, but once, once you let your mind go, you can do anything. And um, as long as you can sell it and you can suspend belief, you can do anything. And that's, 
that's the challenge and that's what's so rewarding is to be able to create that world and pull somebody into it and let them truly believe for the you know the the time that they're in that book that this is real and not only is it real but it could actually happen to them there's a plausibility about it which i love with fantasy because reality sucks i mean <laughs> You know, I have to agree with you a lot of the time, Gwen. Uh, the, there's something to be said for uh, great escapist uh, stories that that take us somewhere else. Um, Aaron, do you do you share this love of fantasy with your mom? Absolutely. Um, it's what I read. I don't read contemporary at all, ever. I hate it. If I'm honest, <laughs> um, I. It's it's the same love. My mum instilled the same love of fantasy in me that her father instilled in her. It's just, it's the way, it's what you want your life to be. And you can actually have that life in a book. So it's it's the best thing in the world. There's nothing better. Except maybe Harry <laughs> Oh, um, you know, one thing that I love about uh, Narnia, and we'll, we'll go back to that for a second because we were, we began the conversation talking about that, is that uh, it's this great portal fantasy. And I think it's uh, it's an introduction for a lot of people to that type of storytelling where you have a, a normal, average, everyday person, uh, but they fall into this whole other world. Um, d- and, and I, I love to, to kind of ponder this because I'm a huge fantasy fan. And if you look at the, the bookshelf that sits behind me in my office, it's, you know, four giant shelves of mostly fantasy books and swords and sorcery and uh, dragons and uh, stuff like that. And there's just something that, that tugs on us that kind of calls us to another place and uh, that, that in fantasy allows us to pretend that we're someone else is somewhere else for a while. Um, it, when you, when you talk to readers who read your books uh, about these great worlds that you create, um, do you get comments from them? Like, you know, um, hey, you guys have allowed me to, to step outside myself for a while and uh, kind of, what kind of feedback do you get from readers about these worlds that you create? Do you want to go for that, Aaron? Um, the, one thing that we were with Queen of Extinction, which is our first published work, it came out earlier this year, our first published work together. Um, the Building a world that people could really fall into was probably one of the most important aspects for us. And it was very Venetian. So we actually went to Venice to do some research and to look at it and to really create an amazing world. And based on what our readers have told us in reviews, it was definitely a worthwhile trip because – they really felt as immersed as we felt while we were in Venice, and that's exactly what we were going for. So we took that Venetian experience and we made it our own. We stuck in some steampunk elements and uh, we put in a dystopian world it's into not, this. It's, it's, it's more fantasy. It's, full, it's fantasy, but it's it's a pretty awful society. You wouldn't actually want to be living there. But then again, just like we said earlier, it is something that you could conceive being reality in your own life. Right. So, right. yeah. I think it's extremely important that your reader can have that, that sense of slipping away. Because after all, why do we read um, fantasy? We read to slip away. We don't read to stay grounded in um our everyday realities. And so if you haven't managed to get your reader to slip away somewhere else, then perhaps the book wasn't as successful as one would have liked it to have right. been. Uh, Gwen, okay. how did you get started writing? Um, you, you've had this love of, of, uh, of books and of adventure and fantasy, but how did you decide uh, that this was something you were going to sit down and, and actually um, you know, put a story together on paper and, and see it through to the end? Well, I started off, as I say, um, doing nonfiction stuff. I was doing corporate copywriting work, which told me that I could write for a living and I could make money out of it. And um, then back in the 90s, my husband and I, we we great uh, adventure travelers. And uh, we, we wrote a number of books on travel in Southern Africa, opening up some very, very remote parts of Southern Africa. And those books um, were this is long before digital, those books all hit bestseller status in South Africa. 
And then I got three kids, and that kind of put paid to everything. And when they were teenagers, I decided to start writing again. I had a story that had been going around in my head for a decade. And um, I used to, when I was alone, or actually not when I was alone, when I was with people, it was a great escape to get into my head and um, act out the story. I would tell myself the story and I'd be cooking supper with all these kids around me. Meanwhile, I'm telling myself the story. And eventually I decided, well, stop telling it and to start writing it. And it's my Crown of Blood series. I'm about to do the last book in that series now. I'm busy working on it now. So it was the need to tell the story that wouldn't go away. Um, and it was like an itch that needed to be scratched. And now that that series is almost finished, as I said, I've got one book left to, to go. It's almost been liberating. Um, finishing that series because now it's a case of okay thank you that's done now I can get on and do some other you know other stuff and bringing Erin on board to work with me has been absolutely fantastic because she's 21 I'm a lot older <laughs> so we're coming at this from two very different ages and she's brought something so magical to my writing. And I've also got a very zany uh, imagination. You put our two imaginations together and you can create a cosmos. It's just unbelievable. It's a god complex, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, there's, there's more truth to that. that you know, we, we laugh about it, but, uh, you know, writers, especially science fiction and fantasy writers, we really do get to create these worlds out of whole cloth and uh it's uh it, it, it's a it's a little um it's a little odd and a little empowering uh, all at the same time that you get to just make people in places out of nothing you know it's uh uh I, I know you guys anchor your your worlds uh you know closely or not closely but uh, maybe informed by real places um, do, do you think that's important? The, uh, even though you're creating something wholly new, uh, having a connection to places that people can maybe envision in their mind, it, does that make them more comfortable or, uh, is it easier just to create something completely not connected to anything? Um, I don't think that it's necessarily something you have to do in grounding it to a place that's uh, a, a real place because if you can conceive it and imagine it then it is real and your reader will be able to conceive it and imagine it too it doesn't necessarily have to be based in reality i mean like if you read any science fiction and it's set on a different planet and it's got different kinds of plants and different kinds of creatures you can still conceive and imagine them they're still real to you it doesn't have to be based in reality but that being said, sometimes things that are based on things that we all know are nice because it gives our reader a very, very clear picture. So I don't think that it's important either way. I think both ways works really well. Gotcha. I, I, tend, to, I tend to like to ground things in something. And when I start writing, I say, well, this is going to be what this place looks like. I try and envision something somewhere on planet earth and say right well that's my that's the 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 starting point now let's go wild from there um that i i generally tend to do how that's how we started off with venice and it took a left turn um but yeah to ground things into reality um, you tend to uh merge and blend uh genre into this uh really great new thing um kind of like you know steampunk and fantasy and uh post apocalyptic maybe or or, or uh, dystopian uh with a little bit of science fiction um you know as i've said it before that as as readers uh you know, I don't read all in one genre. I don't read only fantasy or only science fiction or only thriller. Um, I, I read a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and and I try to bring authors to the show that represent all of the the different things that I'm interested in, in and hopefully the audience is interested in. Um, why do you think that people are so strict about writing into genre uh, when when we all you know like 
uh, different things. And if we have a an author that's brave enough to try to you know mix in some of these different things, we really come up with with these really new and fresh uh, ideas. But why do you think people are so scared to mix in a little bit of things that are different? I think there are two reasons. I think if you traditionally published, it's because bookstores don't have a shelf called Mashup. <laughs> They've got, you know, they like to know that this fits into that shelf. Right. And it's as simple as that. And I think that's why um, you don't really get mashups in the trad world. And I think in indie, um, everybody's scared. And we've we all... Rightly or wrongly, I'm not making a judgment call. I'm just putting it out there. We all believe we need to write to market, and we all believe that writing to market means that you write within a recognizable genre so that you can get a really good string of keywords and that you can make sure that your also boards look exactly what they should look like. When you're writing a mashup, your also boards tend to be interesting um, and we all know that Amazon is a big search engine and all Amazon really wants to do is uh, point product to people who want that product. And if you start messing with your also boards and you start messing with your genre, Amazon doesn't really know what to do with you. So um, if you in the serious business of, you know, six figure incomes and what have you, then you're probably not going to be that excited about writing to uh, writing a mashup and you're going to say, well, you know, I'm writing military sci-fi or I'm writing thrillers or I'm, you know, and it's, and you're very clean and you're very clinical and you stick to the tropes and you do the stuff. And yeah, um, that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> but you are a very savvy uh, writer and, uh, and publisher and, and marketer of your books um, and and have been extremely successful. Um, how do you uh, how do you answer the folks that say stuff like, well, you know, you you really need to to be uh, you know more um, uh, you know consistent with your genre and and all the things that you just named. How do I answer them? Um, it's a difficult one because. I'm not going to lie to you. Marketing a mashup is not an easy thing. It's um, it's not cut and dried, and you you have to be willing to to make certain sacrifices, and perhaps not have an e as easy a road as the guy that's writing military sci-fi, whatever. Um, but when you, and perhaps it does take longer to establish an audience. But once you've got that audience, I think of Lindsay Barocca. Um, Lindsay, forgive me for quoting you. But Lindsay freely admits that she will sit down and try and write to market. And she's, you know, she's not even 10 pages in and she's taken a left turn. <laughs> but her, her readers know that. Yeah. And if you yeah. read Lindsay Barocca, that's what you're wanting. You come to her expecting that experience. It's the same people who read my stuff, and now Erin, unfortunately, she's been sucked into this, <laughs> um, uh, will know that there will be a left turn somewhere. And um, you cultivate those readers, and it takes time, and you build them up, and you market accordingly, and uh, that's how you... You approach your marketing from that angle, that you're not doing straightforward stuff. You're actually having to be a little bit canny and trying to uh, find readers in a different way to what someone just writing straight um, genre-specific spe stuff would do. So, for example, if I'm doing a newsletter swap, let me do something very practical. I won't... Um, if you're thinking, okay, I want to keep my also boards nice and clean... I will only newsletter swap with authors who write, you know, strictly within my genre. I don't think like that. I think, hmm, I need to do some uh, newsletter swaps because I want to promote this book. And I know my book contains the following elements and I've got them listed and I'll post in Facebook and say I'm looking for newsletter swaps and 10 people will put their hands up. I'll go and look at their books and say, okay. I could have that person's also boards in my also boards. They might not be writing exactly what I'm writing, 
but there is something in their book that is similar to mine. So you have to think out of the box that way on how you look at your marketing. And if I'm doing a paid ad, sometimes I'll put it down as science fiction. Other times I'll put it down as, as fantasy. Other time I'll put it down as steampunk. So I'm trying to um, spray the whole wall, basically. And in in this environment, in this uh, uh, day and time which we live, uh, authors really have to be prepared to be uh, publishers and marketers. And uh, you really need to be on top of your game when it comes to that so that the, this book that you love, that you put all of your heart and soul into, can actually find that audience. Well, I think that... There, there are people who write just because they want to write and they want the pleasure of having written a book, and kudos to them. Anybody who writes a book, as far as I'm concerned, they deserve a prize because we all know what goes into it. But if you are looking to make an income out of it, yeah, you have to. And mm -hmm. even as um, traditionally published authors, they don't get to sit around and in their little garrets all day. Their publishers expect them to be out there too. Uh, marketing and doing so yeah you've got to be a marketer you wear a lot of hats and and that is uh that's something that i hear over and over again it especially from the the trad pub uh guys uh i've had numerous authors who have uh who are traditionally published and have been publishing for a long time and 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 they talk about that that you know the world has changed and that you you have to be cultivating that audience all the time, even though you have a publisher behind you. It's uh, that doesn't mean what it used to mean. No, it doesn't. Um, Aaron, I, I want to shift gears for just a second. Um, growing up with a, a mother who is an author, um, my kids see what I do, and uh, my oldest son is a writer as well. Uh, but uh, some of my other kids don't necessarily. Um, uh, it's just not something that interests them. Uh, what was it about watching your mother? Uh, it, it was well. Let me let me rephrase that. Was watching your mother the thing that really uh, sparked the interest in you, or uh, did you feel that this was something you were going to do anyway? And having a mother uh, who did it around and close by uh, was just uh, kind of on the job training. Um, I think I always knew that I was going to write a book and it was going to be a fantasy book and I wanted it published uh, by whatever means necessary. I always knew that it was going to happen. I was going to make it happen. And I think that having a parent who was an author and who was constantly talking to me about her stories and her books and asking me to read chapters for her and tell her what I thought, that just pushed me further to be, okay, I need to write my book. I want to write the book. I want to be doing what she's doing because this is incredible and I love it so much. It, I think it didn't push me to write, but it pushed me to write sooner than I would have if I didn't have an author as a parent. Right. Uh, what was the uh, the first idea that you had, Erin, of, of the book that you wanted to write? Um, okay. <laughs> well, the first ideas when I was younger, I'm not going to mention because they were crap. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I wrote my first proper book when I was 16 and at the time I didn't really have a concept of how long a first book should be and it's just under 200,000 words I still have the document and I know that one day I will go back to it and it was basically about somebody who had been genetically um altered to have all of these magical powers that she wasn't supposed to have and something went wrong with the alteration and each time she gains a new ability or power, she loses a little bit of her humanity and she starts to feel another presence in her mind, the worst version of her versus the best version of her. And both of these versions are living inside her body while she is trying to undo what these terrible people who are destroying lives by altering genetics and stuff like that, she's trying to undo it all while trying to save someone she loves who has been really hurt by them so it, they it's all about her journey and coming to grips with the worst version of herself versus the best and choosing to love herself despite both of them and loving both of them and saving the world as the good fantasy always is. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, you guys have uh, uh, have a, a new series uh, that you're working on. Uh, the first book of that is out, Queen of Extin- Extinction, a dark Sleeping Beauty uh, retelling. And if you just heard a door open, that's uh, my dog just uh, opened the, the <laughs> office and, and came in uh, and wanted to get in on the conversation. So, um, what uh, what drove you guys to uh, to collaborate on on this book? Well, we've been talking about collaborating since I was a teenager. We've been talking about it for a very, very long time. And we got to a point where we were like, why are we talking about doing it one day? Let's do it right now. And I I still remember the day. It was almost a year ago to the day now when we were sitting and talking about the story and deciding, okay, this is what we're going to do and we're going to start it now. And Mm -hmm. then the ball started rolling and now we're halfway down the hill. Nice. nice. What was what was the idea for the story? We decided we wanted to do a story. Um, in a, in addition to having all this action and adventure in our stories, we have certain the every author has themes, I'm sure, but the themes that we wanted to um, uh, explore in the Sleeping Beauty uh, trilogy were the themes that what is beauty and beauty doesn't have to be something that's exterior. Beauty is actually what comes from within. So our sleeping beauty is actually not very beautiful physically at all. Um, She is what's known as an infirm. She, her magic is suppressed and in suppressing her magic due to the plot, um, it's turned her into a very frail, um, an ugly duckling. An ugly duckling, really. And how through coming alive, through waking up, this beauty who wakes up, she discovers strength within and beauty within that actually changes what's happening on the outside. Mm-hmm. So um, it's a different take on Sleeping Beauty. She's not the, you know, the, the beautiful rosebud that you imagine in the typical Sleeping Beauty uh, retelling. But as with all the books, there's lots lots of uh, intrigue, lots of action, lots of adventure, lots of magic, lots of magical creatures, gorgeous dragon shapeshifter. I mean, how can you go wrong? She's obsessed with them. I love taking these, um, uh, these tropes uh, and these ideas that are kind of uh, already ingrained in everyone's mind. Uh, everyone knows the Sleeping Beauty story. Um, everyone knows fantasy tropes. Everyone knows about dragons and wizards and, um, you know, uh, trolls and, and elves and, and all of that. But, uh, but as authors, we take those, that toolkit, um, that everyone's equipped with and something new and different comes out of it. And, uh, I, I, I love seeing a new twist on something, uh, something old or something, uh, that, that we all already have, you know, deep feelings about, um, are, are you ever uh, worried about taking something like Sleeping Beauty and uh, and people getting upset that you're that you're taking something so um, so ingrained and doing something new with it? It is a good night. You know something? People will find any reason to be offended or upset. You can't let <laughs> of course that, they will. Yeah, you, know, you can't let that interrupt what you're trying to do and what you love because those people's opinions really don't matter at all. So just do what you love. And just just go with it. Yeah. Um, so you guys also uh, are collaborating uh, on a book in uh, in this great new box set uh, that's coming out in just a couple of weeks, uh, yeah. Dominion Rising. Uh, what is your contribution to that set? I'm going to let Erin talk about <laughs> this one. All right. It is a high fantasy uh it's basically about a soul reaper, somebody who uses a magical cursed sword to steal souls from the dead. And she feeds them to this magical weapon that's kept inside a human bone. And this bone is stolen and they have to try to get it back again before it is used against them. And it's a bit of a whodunit. There's a big mystery in it. There's a lot of romance. There are fae in it. So people who like Sarah Jemmas as I do will... Really, really like this book. Um, we've had 
a hell of a run writing this book, but it's been really good. It's been fantastic. Yeah, it's a it's a very dark fantasy. Um, who done it? Lots of mystery, um, and uh, it's creepy as hell. I I can't. Not gonna lie, I have a nightmare about it. I wrote the damn thing. Uh, I, I can't. I can't imagine the two of you. Uh, is uh, as wonderful and, and jovial and genial as you are writing dark fantasy that would give me nightmares. Trust me, it's creepy as <laughs> I love it. There are times we just looked at each other and be like, what the hell? <laughs> but the good news is our <laughs> developmental editor and our beta readers love it. So, so we're good. We're right. It's not, it's not too creepy. I love it. I love it. Uh, you know, which, which brings about a great question. Um, you know, writing really does uh, give us this outlet and this avenue to explore things that we would never explore in real life you know it's kind of like uh, you know Stephen King has talked about many times that people people come up to him and ask him you know why was your childhood so horrible and and he was like oh, I had a great childhood and they said well how do you write the crazy crap that you do then you know <laughs> but um you know it's it's really interesting that we get to uh explore uh topics and situations and maybe live vicariously um, through our characters and, and uh, maybe go through the motions of situations that we never would before. Um, what do you think about that as writers? Oh, it's fun. I love it. I mean, I'm the, I'm the kind of reader slash writer who, if the character even has like one trait that's slightly similar to me, I will self-insert, and that character is me, and this is my adventure. <laughs> and I love the adventure, knowing that I have a sword that can reap souls, even if I don't actually. It still feels great. So um, despite the creepiness, the creepiness actually makes it even better because it makes it less in this world and more something exciting and new and fun and adventurous. So I enjoy the creepy stuff and the whole creating new things like that. And it was the first time we'd written a mystery. Yes. So that that was interesting. Half the time she kept having to come to me and say, okay, can you please remind me who did it and how did they do it? <laughs> 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 it comes back to me being very linear. It was Colonel Mustard. She needs to know everything at once. The little clues, because they have to be threaded all through the book. She knows she needs them right now, all at once. Oh, it's nice. <laughs> I'm a big picture person. I'm a little details person, which means that we work really well together because we cover each other. Well, that um, and that's a, a great place for me to ask this: How um, kind of what are the mechanics of the two of you working together? I'm always intrigued by how uh, co-authors share the duties, and um, uh, it, it's really great because when it's done well. And I know you guys have uh, that when you read it, uh, you really can't tell where one person is and where the other is. It becomes this really cohesive thing. Uh, so how do you structure it when you're you're sharing writing duties between two people? What we do is I will write the first draft, then I will hand it over to Gwen. She tells me where it sucks and she changes it. And then we go over it together and decide on the changes and whether we like them. And um, it's really got 50-50 of both of us in there. So. We sit down beforehand. And um, I'm not really a pantser. I like to I outline. Am. She's a pantser. Erin's a pantser. I'm an outliner. So she endures me sitting down with her for, you know, a few days before we start writing and getting a really yeah. solid structure and outline. And then she endures me handing her the book and she's saying, this is not what we discussed. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's great. I, I had a sip of coffee and I almost spit it all over my microphone. Um, no, we like uh, it's the adventure of uh, it's not just pantsing, there's a plot like you know where you gotta get to, but it's the adventure that the characters take you. They're writing you, not the other way around. But we plot the whole thing out properly beforehand so we know exactly where we want to go and how it has to end and everything like that. There's no deviating from like the who done it. We know who did it and how they did it. But there may be some scenes where they go off and do something that we were not expecting. Right. Or rather, she was not expecting. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I, I like the idea that one of you is a plotter and the other is a pantser, and and you just kind of work with each other in that structure. That's uh, that's really hilarious, um, actually. Uh, so you guys, uh, but before you start writing, uh, Aaron, even though you're a, a pantser, uh, you have an idea of the story. You guys have kind of hammered out a roadmap for it, so to speak. We know exactly where it needs to go, what uh, uh, plot points need to happen, when they need to happen, and how the book has to end, everything like that. But that doesn't mean that there isn't room for a little bit of adventure and the characters telling us what they want to do. Because I find that if you try to force the character into doing something that you imagine is right, they're not going to do it, and you're going to get yourself stuck in a rift. So I find it's it's a lot easier to let your character take the wheel, and you're going to end up where you wanted to go anyway, but you're going to do it the way they would do it. But so uh, I can sleep at night um, <laughs> during the writing process. We sit together and we write an outline. Yeah. And um, and we know, okay, we, we're aiming for X number of words, so we've got to get this into that, you know, the three-act play, and we've got it all sorted out. And in my head, I can see it. I can see the big picture so that when I come in um, – when she gives me her chapters and I go through them and sort of I, I pull the whole thing together and make it that homogeneous um, whole, um, I at least know where I, I don't like being surprised while I'm doing that. So I, I like to know that the whole thing is following a sequence. But we actually work very well together. We listen yeah. to the same playlist. Oh, my gosh, I'm so sick of that playlist. <laughs> and uh, we listen. The same playlist with few additions <laughs> for the last six months, and we're ready to. Yeah. The Beauty and the Beast soundtrack can go die now. I'm so sick of it. Yes, Wonder Woman soundtracks. No, that's, that's well, that one's still pretty good. good. Yeah. <laughs> just, just hanging on by its teeth. By, yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. I, I also love movie soundtracks to write to. There's something uh, that just puts me in a different place mentally uh you know maybe it's the the rise and fall of the uh, you know as the music is following the narrative on the screen that uh you know it's written that way on purpose uh, maybe those things i i don't really know what it is but it's a it's it's, it's definitely a motivator it definitely is for me as well yeah. Yeah. um so you guys are are like seriously at this uh how many books do you have uh planned for this cycle that you're writing Oh gosh! Well, we've got the we've at the the Queen of Extinction is a trilogy, and we've got the first two of those out now. Erin's uh, about to start working. We we're about to start plotting out the final one, Queen of Creation, and then she's going to start working on that while I finish up my Last Crown of Blood uh, book. Then we've got the first book in uh, Reign of uh, Bones and Steel, Reign Steel, Steel, and, Steel, Steel and, Bone. and Bone. It's changed a couple of times, so we're still confused about it. <laughs> Which we just finished for Dominion Rising. And we've just finished a book that we were commissioned by a literary agent. We were approached in January um, for a, a, a literary agent, New York literary agent asked us for some a brand new novel, um, which we put together this year as well. So we've done, I think we've done four books this year. It's yeah. been quite hectic. Yeah. Uh, it's been quite stressful, but we did the book for him and uh, we sent it into him and we got an email back saying, enjoyed reading this, uh, won't have any difficulty selling it to a publisher. So yeah. we'll see that. Comes. We had a little dance party. Oh, we did. When we saw that. Well, <laughs> of course you did. We had a 30 second dance we were very excited. We're still very excited. As you should be. As you should be. Um, and, you know, it's a really great time. I, I talk about this all the time that um, I, I think people uh, – indie publishing is amazing. Um, I love it. Uh, it has uh, given me a platform. It has given uh, you guys a platform. It has given so many – uh, authors that we mutually know a platform to get their stories out there. Uh, traditional publishing uh, is amazing and has given so many people platforms to get their work out there. And um, 
you know, there there are too many times where I, I see people kind of plant their flag with one or the other and say, this is the only way to do it. This my way is so much better than your way. And uh, really what what the indie revolution in my mind did is give authors freedom uh, to to do the best thing for them and for their book at the time. And I'm really happy that you guys are. are I'm, I'm sorry. No, okay. I, I just uh, absolutely agree with you. Yeah, that this is a this is a wonderful time because people have choices now, and uh, and sometimes this thing is better for this book, and sometimes that thing is better for this book, and uh, you know that that's kind of part of that being flexible that we talked about earlier is you know being open to all the opportunities that come around. Why put all your eggs in one basket? That's right. Just yeah, spread out and see what works yeah. for you. Uh, so the first two books of the Queen of Extinction trilogy are out, and uh, your your brand new novel is coming out with Dominion Rising, which is the uh, first week of August. Is it August eighth? I guess I guess eighth, it's technically the, the second week. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm super excited for that to drop. There's so many great books in there, and uh, you can still pre-order it for only ninety nine cents. So uh, if anyone's listening and hasn't pre-ordered it yet, what are you waiting for? Um, uh, but where can people find you guys online if they want to, if they've been intrigued by your work and, and, and want to follow along with what you do? Well, I've got a website, uh, gwynwhite.com. Um, and then, of course, my Amazon page. And I'm also on Facebook. Um, starting to get a foothold on Instagram <clears throat> slowly. Um, <laughs> Erin has a more I, diverse. I my website will be up later this month, so keep an eye out for that, guys. I also have a Facebook, I have an Instagram, and I also have a YouTube channel where I talk about books and bookish things, and basically go nuts over them because I'm a huge fan girl. Nice. So yeah, nice. So well, I'll be sure to link it all up uh, in the show notes. Uh, Gwen and Erin, thank you so much for taking time. Uh, uh, early in this day for me, but late in the day for you guys. Uh, thanks for, for staying up and, uh, and joining me on the show today. Oh, it's been such a pleasure. It's, it's always it's such a joy to talk with you. Thanks so much for having us. Stay tuned now for a clip from the Jason Crane series by Richard Glebes. There's a link to the entire series in the show notes. As always, tune in every Tuesday and Friday for new episodes of the Author Stories Podcast. Find all of the archives at hankgarner.com. Now on to our clip from the Jason Crane series by Richard Gleaves. They reverently slipped Jason's giant size X-Men number one from its Mylar protector. Drinking in the sweet aroma of browning paper and three-color process that signals only the best and rarest and most wonderful of collectibles. On one page, Professor X raised his fingers to his temples and rallied his X-Men, his psychic commands radiating from his bald head like waves off hot asphalt. I have psychic powers, Owen blurted. I want Wolverine's claws. Jason was turning a page. Snicked! Or, hey, get this, get this. Lightsabers poking out the backs of my hands. Or even, no, no, I'm totally serious. I have psychic powers. No, you don't. I do. Jason laid the comic on the bedspread. He sighed. Owen could be such a spaz sometimes. Okay, he said indulgently. What number am I thinking of? Stop. It doesn't work that way. What I can do is called a psychic reading, off an object, like getting impressions. When the doorbell rings, if I put my hand on the knob, as soon as I do, I know who's there. It's called looking through the peephole, moron. Shut up! And when I touch the phone, I know who's calling. I'm sure, Mr. Bullshit from Bullshit Mountain. Like my sister or my grandmother, I just know it's them. There's no such thing as psychics. Okay, you try. Don't be stupid. Are you chicken? Fine! Okay. He snatched up a brown paper bag, spotted with grease, and dumped a few stale french fries into the trash can. I'll put an object in this bag, and you try to guess what it is. Turn your back. Jason did, and heard a rustling behind his head. Okay, you can look now. Owen produced the bag. It was rounded with some object now. Don't touch yet, just think. Try to imagine what's inside. Your lunch? Jason sneered. 
but he closed his eyes and tried to imagine. He could hear Owen's breathing. Jason's nose itched. His brain grew bored with nothing to look at, and fragments of images swam in and out of his imagination. Strawberry, he blurted. Owen reached into the bag, producing a white bowl. Jason had eaten frosted flakes from it about three days ago. A few stuck to it, like little beige fish scales. See? I lose. No, look here. Owen pointed. A design went around the sides of the bowl. A long string of vines and painted fruit. With strawberries. That's... Jason began, but didn't know how to end the sentence. It's cool. See? What did I tell you? Do it again. Jason closed his eyes. An image like daisies and sun and... Yellow, he blurted after three seconds. Oh my god, open your eyes! Owen held a bright yellow highlighter pen. I hadn't even put it in the bag! And so they went, for thirty minutes or more. A staple remover, a toy soldier, a sweat sock, a pencil. Jason never said precisely what was in the bag, but it was always close or related. He'd imagine a cockpit, and Owen would produce a game controller. He'd say, plate, and the object would be a CD. He made right angles with his pointer fingers, shrugging, only to have Owen pull out Eliza's knitting needles. His friend became more and more enthusiastic, but Jason became a little scared. You have a real gift, Owen said. You're, like, brilliant. Owen babbled for a long time about astral projection and ESP, how Jason was picking up signals from Owen's own psychic powers, which had obviously been doing the broadcasting. Owen left that night full of plans and experiments, vindicated in his beliefs. Jason sat on the bed after Owen left, thinking hard. He had no explanation for what he'd done, but he 